Welcome everybody. Thank you for thank you for showing up today. It's lovely to see so many of you, so many of my beloved faces here. It's lovely. Um, so today is so first first about that video. So the, all the images that you saw are from the James Webb Space Telescope, and the music you heard was composed by our other guest today my beloved Jim Walker, my classmate from seminary, and uh, a musician, a composer. And uh, the other guest we have today is somebody that it's, it's a very strange story because we were in school together, in grade school. And I wouldn't have known that she had become an astrophysicist and working on this stuff if there was no Facebook. So we re-met on Facebook, and here we are. So it's a, it's a strange world that we live in. So I just want to speak, say a few words as a, as a contextualization, and then we'll have a little conversation, the three of us, and then we'll do a little reflection and we'll open it for conversation. That's, that's the plan, roughly the plan of the evening. So the first thing that I want to speak about is why we decided, what, why I thought that this would be a good idea to do a gathering around this theme is as these images were coming up in the media, I was just really marveling how these images are showing up at a time of so much fragmentation and so much polarization where people are just in some ways like dividing into smaller and smaller circles and saying, this is mine and this is not mine. And, and in the middle of that, these images showing up that are showing how we all belong to this one universe and how like our, our differences are so minute, so minuscule, like it's ridiculous to, to focus on that. And I felt like it can't be an accident that these images are showing up at this time. So that's, that's what kind of got me thinking about it. And the other thing, of course, I mean, I've always kind of really loved this Carl Sagan saying that we're all made of star stuff. And here star stuff was actually coming into our living rooms, thanks to media, thanks to social media, thanks to the ways in the past it wouldn't have had have happened. And then I, as I started to read more about it, I heard things like some of these images are from stars that are 13 billion years old. People were talking about cosmic dawn. It's like, how do you even sit with an idea of cosmic dawn? Like, how do I, as a person living in this day, day and time, even conceptualize the idea? And one of the things that uh, I was really reminded of is Joseph Campbell talking about how one of the problems of our current time is we have no myth. We have no myth to live by. There's no common myth, no shared myth. And towards the end of his life, he wrote a book called Outer Reaches of Inner Space, where he was inspired by our landing, the human species landing on the moon. And he was saying, oh, this is where the new myth is going to come from because we have exhausted all sources of mystery and magic and unknowing on the planet. Of course, now we are finding that we actually don't understand the deep oceans very much either, but we definitely don't understand outer space. So, so, so I was kind of just wondering how, what kind of a myth would arise both collectively and for us as individuals if we sat with this image of the cosmic dawn and, and, and the fact that we belong to this household of the galaxies. And the last idea that I'll throw in before uh, we can begin the conversation is something that again, I've been, I've been reflecting a lot about lately is the word universe versus cosmos. And I find that the two resonate very differently for me when I think of universe, I focus on the uni, it's one verse. And 
it has a center, it has a periphery, even if I cannot measure it or no one can measure it. Whereas cosmos feels more multi-centric, more, more uh, capable of holding myths and stories. And I think of cosmology versus universalize. So I, I want to also sit with those two possibilities as we think of what is the myth I want to live? Is it the myth of the universe or the myth of, myth of the cosmos? And of course we have experts here to talk about it. And uh, David, if you want to um, spotlight both Sangeeta and, Jay, uh, and Jim at this point. All right. So we'll start with you Sangeeta. Hello. Thank you. And I think the first question I want to ask you is what do these words mean to you? So when you say myth, so a lot of people myth, uh, see myth as opposite of truth. What you're looking for and what we are looking for is, is the story of our origin. Where do we come from? Where does anything come from? Where does the sun come from? That. And that's what cosmology is, is uh, trying to address. And you have very good words about universe versus cosmos. And I'll need to think about those. But uh, trust me, you know, the sort of learning about our origin is is a fundamental intellectual hunger amongst all of us. And, and, and we are using science and instruments to do that. And yeah. yeah, there are a lot of questions we don't have answers for. There are a lot of questions we have answers for that are more complete today than they were 20 years ago. So it's a constant journey. Do you want to maybe tell us a little bit of, in layman's language, what you're learning that's new? Okay, so, all right. So I'll, I'll, I'll put my scientist hat on. I was, uh, you know, had gone into the spiritual sphere. So um, first of all, myself, I'm Sangeeta Malhotra. I work for NASA. And today what I'm talking about are my views and not NASA's. So um, I'm also a scientist and um, I, the Hubble came before JWST and I have worked for Hubble and I'm also working on uh, Nancy Grace Roman telescope, which will come after JWST. So, but I did not build JWST. I haven't worked on building JWST, so, but I've used the data and things like that. Okay, so as a scientist, one of the uh, subjects that's focus of my science is to learn how the cosmic dawn came about. We, we, we know the Big Bang happened and then atoms formed and they got together, make, made galaxies and stars formed in those galaxies. So we're basically going after the first light. You had, to, I mean, the, the basically galaxies formed from gas clouds sort of shrinking and contracting under their own gravity and then Stars form. This is a very basic uh, sort of picture. The details are, are huge. What was the size distribution? What happened? When did it happen? How were they distributed? How were they clustered? All of these things we, or, or even when did stars start happening? When was the point when you said, hey, let there be light? So that's what we are studying. Sometimes as a half joke, I say, I, I, I want to look uh, further and further in time to find galaxies further and further until I stop finding them. And then I will, when, I'm, when I fail, I will have reached my goal to the, to the beginning of time. So it's, it's kind of half joking, but that, that is the simplest idea here. Now, um, as you go farther and farther, these things get fainter and they also go redder because of redshift, which I, details I won't go into. So uh, Hubble took us within 
the first billion years of uh, the universe's existence and it, it's it's like the, within the first five percent of its age so if the universe uh, up to today was 100 years old we went to we got to see what it looked like as a child as a five-year-old and and jwst is giving even more details of that era and maybe going up to three years or four years something like that so that that's what we are doing with these images and and as i said it's 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 a it's empowering that we can do this. We can build instruments and fly them and we can do it. It's also awe striking that we are able to do this and also humbling that from one year to next, we keep improving our knowledge for one decade to next. And, but we're not get, I mean, there's so many things still, so many questions still unanswered, so. Yeah, and I remember when I was chatting with you earlier, one of the things you were commenting is how scientists from all over the world participated in making this possible. Yeah. You want to speak a little bit to that? And, and the other powerful message that I take from this is, you know, this, this was so challenging. It take, took 20 some years to build. Uh, we have uh, NASA, and then we have the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency, and even within those uh, body, uh, you know, um, uh, groups, there are people of all nationalities. And if we can come together to see almost the very beginning of time, light from there we can use some of that same energy to solve other problems. We, we, just, we just need to have the humility and the persistence to do that. Um, I hope we can, but we shall see. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna turn a little to Jim now. And Jim, I wanna ask you when Sangeeta talks about the cosmic dawn and the first light as an artist, as a composer, as a musician, what happens to you? I think the first thing that struck me with that deep field image, the first released image, was just this overwhelming sense of awe. And, um, you know, as as I reflected on that, I thought, you know, what better image could there ever be with which to practice Visio Divina, for instance? You know, allowing God to speak to your heart through that image. And um, I, I can only heartily recommend holding that image close. Um, it will help you through again and again things that you can't even foresee that may be troubles in your life, difficulties in your life, because it can help you, in my humble opinion, to rekindle that sense of awe. And um, if we collectively can't recover that, we have lost something very, very precious. Yeah, um, and, and sorry. Okay. No, 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 go ahead. I was just thinking that the word that's that was used to talk about that sense of awe that you're talking about was numinosity, the numinous. And one of yeah. the qualities of numinous is being awestruck. That that's our response to what we don't understand. We, in some ways we can't understand. And I loved yeah. how Sangeeta was talking about like the day that I reach my Holy Grail is when I can't find galaxies anymore, which means I have gone right. to the time point before right. galaxies were formed. It's, it's, yeah, I, mean, I don't know, it me, gives me goosebumps. It, well, it does as me as well. And um, I, I guess after, after a few days of, of kind of settling in with this image, which was so overwhelming to me, um, and it's only a, a slice, it's only a slice of what's there. And uh, be going beyond that slice is, uh, uh, practically inconceivable to me, but um, 
it made me want to go back on on the topic of metaphysics and music, which is something that has been um, a sort of sort of a a favorite child for philosophers for so many years. Um, Kant called music an example of the noumenon, the thing, as opposed to the phenomenon, which is our perception of the thing. And uh, Schopenhauer called music the most direct access to what he called fundamental reality. But the one that really got me when I went back on all these uh, readings was Roger Scruton. And uh, I want to quote this because if I miss one word, because it's like poetry to me, uh, I feel like I've screwed it up. But he said, music is something which induces a response in us in which we acquire a first person perspective on a state of mind, which is not our own. Hmm. And I'm not sure I even know what that means, but I, Can I go back Can you read it on one his... more time, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, music is something which induces a response in us in which we acquire a first person perspective on a state of mind, which is not our own. Mm. Uh, what that is really in reference to, um, I'm still working on, but you know, is that, is that a reference to the composer or is it a, a reference to that fundamental reality? So um, in either case, um, ego aside, I think it's a, it's a really, really deep statement on on what you know the universe is all about. It's this endlessly creative thing. Yes, endlessly creative. That's a it's a gorgeous metaphor. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the Greek philosophers talking about the song of the spheres. Yep. And they were the first ones actually to use the word cosmos. I think it meant like a star-filled firmament. And they felt that yeah. this, this was a place of perfection. So it, Yes, exactly. And, and it was also a place in which, um, I mean, I don't want to color the conversation, but it was also a state where, a point in time where uh, Pythagoras sort of established probably one of the first dogmas of music uh, by defining what uh, a proper scale was. And um, as opposed to what the universe does, which is the universe is in vibration. The universe is sound. Uh, music is a man-made concept. So um, the, the difference between the two, um, because the universal, the universal perspective was hard to grab onto. So the dogma began to develop and, and, um, it's kind of too bad. I mean, I found out many 40 years ago that uh, what I was composing was uh, highly dogmatic and, and uh, a subject of the times. And I threw it all away. And since then, I decided that I'd rather find another way to receive this uh, that's less ego-based than that whole system was. So um, to me, that's been a blessing. Um, and and when I when I look at these images, I just uh, I feel like I'm I'm you know I've affirmed that choice. Have any comments on that, Sangeeta? How how is this landing for you? Oh, it's 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 very um, it's profound. I'm not sure I understand everything, but you don't have to understand everything in music to appreciate it. I, 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 I listened to music you composed, uh, Reverend Walker, and I felt that awe, oh, the sense of awe and um, the constant longing, the ever more longing. And I, I, I hope that's what you were trying to convey because that's what I felt. Well, thank you for the translation, <laughs> but I, I do- uh, The words I, are so I, inadequate, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I, I, I do believe that, um, you know, there is this, um, as, as these philosophers stated much, so much more well than I could, that, that there is this, this uh, ineffable quality about music that is something which touches us directly. And it doesn't, 
it doesn't matter uh, what the genre is, mm -hmm. but that it is something which is received and mm -hmm. transmitted and heard by others. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to have, I don't think much more purpose than that, but it is something of a, um, a means by which we are communicating with uh, what these guys call the fundamental reality. And, and that's mm -hmm. not our observance. It's just, it's it, it's there. It's something which exists and how we perceive it is our, um, is the phenomenon, not the, uh, not the noumena. Mm. Sangeeta, one last question for you before we move on to the next part. So it, it can be, it may be a little bit personal. So answer how you want, but after you've put aside all the equations, all the graphs, all the plots, why do you do this work? What keeps you going? Because I want to know more. I want to understand more. I never get there to a perfect understanding or perfect knowledge. But the journey is it. This is my journey, that's all. Um, I've, I was a poor child in, in Delhi and we used to sleep on the flat rooftops uh, most of the year, not in winter or, or rainy season, of course. And there was a whole sky. I looked at it every night. I wanted to know about it. That's all. So you knew back then when we were sleeping on the roofs because of load shedding that you wanted <laughs> to be an astrophysicist? I never thought I would be. But every time I said, okay, I'll take this one more step. And it, uh, uh, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And that's been my philosophy, you know. I've often not dared to look beyond one more step. So there's the undergraduate and then the master's and then the PhD and then the next step and then the next step. So you can only take one step at a time. Uh, I think I must have lucked out in so many ways. So. Thank yeah. you for taking the step. <laughs> I guess, can I ask a question of you? Absolutely real quickly and this is just my um probably ignorance but if if web theoretically were to be able to be positioned at the furthest distance away that it can now see what would it see then oh so if it was 13 billion light years away yes Oh, it would see these things. So it would see these things, but it would see them in a different color, in a different color. So all these red things would be blue. I mean, the distant red blue. things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, I, ultra, ultraviolet. So. If I flipped that question and said, if web could be positioned at, at the farthest point of its vision right now and turn back towards the future, what would it see? So we can't see the future. Uh, I mean, as far as we understand, we're looking, physics, at the past, right? we are looking at the past. And we can't even see those galaxies as they are today. Right. We only see them as they were when that light left them. So if you want to understand it in a sort of, uh, you know, a basic way, it's like, uh, suppose there was no Facebook or Twitter or news or anything like that. The only way you could get news is by newspapers, printed newspapers. That's within the realm of we can understand, okay? And then suppose there were, there were no airplanes. It was only the trains that went from East Coast to West Coast. And you were living in California, okay? And it takes three days for the trains to get to California. And the only newspaper is New York Times, okay? 
And in California, you will, you cannot see what's happening in New York today. You can only know what's hap what happened three days ago because it takes three days for the information to go through. Okay, so you're limited by the speed at which information travels. Such is also light, which is the fastest thing that we know travels, right? We don't know what those galaxies are today. Okay, they've, they've moved beyond the stages we see them at. So that five-year-old universe we see has grown up. It probably looks like things near us. But what we are seeing is what it was like five years, uh, you know, 13 billion years ago, roughly. Right, right. right. So. I gave the portrait of the universe as a young man, a young <laughs> <laughs> James Joyce. Uh, yes. uh, and I don't know whether we should do the reflection now. I'll ask you another question because I really want to ask you, Sangeeta. And it's a big question, and I don't answer as, as you want. Mm -hmm. For you, what is Big Bang? Or what, what, what is that moment when something came from nothing as a scientist and as a person? That's odd. I haven't. Uh, the, 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 the problem is, as a scientist, I've tried to be sort of, I try to be objective. I mean, I'll try an empiricist. I will observe the universe honestly and try to make the deductions as honestly as I can. And I will not, I'll try very hard not to inject my own biases into the way I interpret. We all have our biases, but I, as much as I can see the biases, I'll try not to inject them. But when you start at the singularity, that's when we don't have observations. So as a scientist, it makes me uncomfortable to say this because whatever I say will be my own biases and not based on my observations. So um, as a person living in this world, when I get something for nothing, I, I, I feel kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. No, no. All right. It's, it's an honest answer. Jim, but do you want to take... so, oh, Sorry, go sorry. on. No, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. But sometimes I see, I mean, right now I'm looking at my garden outside the window and just plain dirt and water is giving me vegetables, food to eat. God is kind. We are getting something from nothing all the time. We just forget that in our ingratitude. Jim, you want to take a quick stab at it before we do the meditation? This this idea of what what is this moment? If you were to imagine this moment when there was nothing, and there was something, what's that moment for you? Uh, that moment for me is. Um sacred and um it is that point for me in which possibility began and what comes to me through that possibility is a means uh, unknown to me really i'll be the first to admit that i can touch people and touch the planet, uh, which I feel is so deeply in need of healing. Um, so I think uh, that's not a very, <laughs> it's not a very scientific approach to your question, but I think it is that point in which um, all things first became possible and um, amazingly continue to be possible. It's, it's such an amazing thing. I mean, you think about creation myths from any culture. They, they, they try to put a story around that when something yeah. came out of nothing. 
in, yeah. in India, they would say that's when the Shiva and Shakti came together and creation was formed. In other cultures, there'll be other stories. But it's, right. I think human beings have always wondered. And, and it's, it's the beginning of creativity of any kind. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, and, it's an and, extraordinary and it's, thing. Yeah. You know, sadly to me, and I, I try not to give it a lot of energy, but sadly, um, in even today, in, in more primitive, I, I don't mean it in a demeaning way, but more primitive cultures um, continue to consider music as a birthright and participating in that, uh, each and every one of them uh, without fear uh, and without dogma is, is something that they have, have done since, since they were born. Um, we don't we don't see that for our own reasons, but most of which is is dogmatic. So thank you. So what we'll do now is we'll we'll rerun that video, a small part of the video. And you're invited to just watch the video, reflect if you want to journal, like anything that came out of this conversation for you the infinity, the singularity, whatever, cosmos. And, and then we'll open it up and we'll have some conversation. So David, if you want to unspotlight us and run the shorter video.
So this is a time for us to have a conversation. So anybody have comments, questions? We're a pretty large group, so you might want to raise your virtual hand. I can call on you. Uh, this is a question for Sanjinta. Thank you so much, Sushmita, for arranging this wonderful evening. Thank you for guests for being here. Two questions. One is, have these images shifted or changed your personal or a personal and scientific understanding of time? That's the first question. And the second is, have these images and experiences shifted or changed your understanding or your thoughts about our role in this vast expansiveness? If any. So there's some new results that have come out that show that these galaxies started forming even earlier than we thought and they grew fast. So that's something quantitatively, how fast things uh, started happening, uh, this sort of holy grail we are after. But um, yeah, so that that's one thing. Um, we have written one paper where it's not based on the images, but it's based on splitting up the light from one of the objects. Um, and it's one of the most, and, and, and there by setting up the light, we can say how much oxygen there is in that galaxy. So in the Big Bang, there was hydrogen and helium and all other elements formed thereafter. So for oxygen to be present in the, that, the, that galaxy means they have been stars that have lived and died and produced that oxygen. And that sort of thing, so those are the things I'm, as a professional astronomer, astrophysicist, I'm getting excited about. <laughs> uh, yes, it, uh, I mean, I, I was at the uh, press release thing and one of my colleagues and friends was uh, in the in the panel just uh, showing this. And and when we saw the split up light and which we call the spectrum, uh, uh, b both me and my husband, who were both watching, he's also an astrophysicist, was my classmate. We both laughed it. We were like, my goodness, we can't, you know, these sort of, that sort of data we get for nearby galaxies. And now we are getting it for such distant galaxies. This is, this is a miracle. Yeah. So looking forward to learning so much. This is just a small, small part of what we learn. We learn so much. Today, there was uh, some press think went out one of the planets that's uh, orbiting some other stars. So it's a planet like Earth or Jupiter or something. It's orbiting another star, not our sun. They call them exoplanets. And that one, they saw carbon dioxide in its, or in its uh, atmosphere. So you, you split up the light and you see signatures of carbon dioxide. So we know there's a planet out there with carbon dioxide in it. And we can determine how much carbon dioxide there is. It is it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> uh, you know, for most of my professional life, we've been looking forward to this. And, and sometimes I have to pinch myself. It's really there. It's working. It's working better than we expected. We did it. Love your smile, Sangeeta. <laughs> Sound like a kid in a candy store. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay, we have a hand up from Amy. Yeah, um, this is wonderful. Um, what's alive for me is, Rev, Rev Sushmita, when you were describing the difference in words between universe and cosmology, my mind went to universe like one and verse like song. And so um, when Rev James said 
you, when you talk about even just like the Big Bang Theory, I hear a loud like, <laughs> just really, you know, bang. And Rev James, when you were talking about, you know, first with the sound, and that's sort of how, um, I I for, I can't remember exactly, but. Um, when you're talking about music and sound, that all really resonates with me so much. In fact, um, I come from a, a household where there was a lot of music and I am somebody, and even in my being ordained this past year, one of my vows was to keep my wild, precocious inner child alive and to dance at whatever music comes my way. Um, and I... Uh, I'm just in awe. You know, I grew up watching Star Wars, but this is <laughs> doesn't even compare. And uh, Rev, Rev Sushmita, I like how you said that different cultures share different stories about creation. And that helps me realize that it wasn't just being influenced by the Roman Catholic Church and their story of creation, that that's not unique. It's, it happens, and when you mentioned in India, you have yours. And, and, and this is why I went to One Spirit, so that I could learn all of these things. And this is all very exciting for me. So, thank you. Oh, Rev James, um, I'm a philosophy, I was a philosophy major, and metaphysics, I could talk about that for hours. That was my favorite part of philosophy. I'll shut up. Thank you, Amy, thank you. That was beautiful. And Ed. Yeah, what an awesome presentation. All of it. Uh, my question for Sangeeta is, has more to do with that second, well, the first time I saw that first video with the images and the sound, um, my awe knew no bounds in terms of trying to understand, like we're trying to understand this little piece, like right here. And there's like billions and billions and billions and billions, I can't say enough, how much there is. I don't, under, I don't understand how we could ever even think we could possibly understand all of that. So that's just one comment. But then I also noticed Sangeeta with your, the, your backdrop, there are lots of, there's lots of stuff close to each other. And in the second video, there seemed to be more space in between objects. Is the JWT seeing further out to the point where there are less, you know, like at the beginning of time, there'd be just a few things out there or something like that? Or is that just which piece we were looking at? I, uh... So uh, my backdrop is this whole thing and just one uh, backdrop and the music, uh, the video was very well made. It slowly panned over a field like that. Now, if you're seeing this in the background, see this, these two uh, big fat galaxies in the, they are nearby galaxies. So what we are seeing is not just JWST, this whole cluster that you're seeing the two central galaxies. Of. It's this huge cluster. Now, let me, let me just give you some orientation. Our Milky Way galaxy is a very ordinary galaxy. It's got only about 100 billion stars in it, or 200 billion, something like that, okay? 200 billion, okay. Now, uh, some of the, 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 these two galaxies that you see here, let me see if I can do it with my finger, just where my finger is pointing. Mm -hmm. These are big, fat center or cluster galaxies, uh, and they're even more massive. They're like uh, a trillion stars, something like that, more than that. And what happens is, and they're also clustered together. So that whole cluster is huge. And it's so massive that it bends space time around it. So it acts like a telescope lens, okay? So what we are seeing is magnification because of this cluster lens that we have, which is bending the light and we're getting more light than our share. And also uh, JWST 
is, is you know has its lenses and mirrors and it's collecting all the light. So we've got a double telescope effect in there. You didn't ask for that, but you got it. That's what happens when you invite an astrophysicist. <laughs> so one of the first deep images, they said, "Hey, let's use yeah, let's go point at this cluster so that we can get even more magnification." Well, that's cool. That was a magnified answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. That was a beautiful question. Yeah. Jennifer. Hi. Yeah, it is an incredible presentation, and it, I think awe is the only way I can describe how I'm feeling watching this. As I was watching the video for the second time, I felt like the little galaxies reminded me of cells with like a nucleus in it. It's kind of looked like you could all see a little center in it. And it it just yeah. is almost like a microcosm of a macrocosm of, of, I don't know. And it kind of builds on what I think Amy just commented on the chat. I think she saw something about how, how likely it is there's something else out there, how, why are we the only ones? And when you think of all the history and the drama and everything we have, and we think we are so important in this little tiny, tiny, tiny cell that's infinitesimal uh infinitesimally small it's it's uh it's kind of mind-blowing um because and I, I think um i think it was uh uh james had talked about the, the possibilities and when i look at each of those nuclei galaxies all i can think of was what james said about possibilities endless possibilities um, so it was just it was kind of striking you know we call them galactic nuclei really that's yeah, yeah and the, yeah this they very small pinpoint of light, not not small, but it's, it's pretty, it's actually, most of them are actually black holes. Huh. And the light, so you, that light will show up in the X-ray also. So if you go observe X-rays, uh, there's an X-ray telescope in space called Chandra after the Indian astrophysicist Chandra Sekhar. So if you, anyway, so if you go look at those nuclei in X-rays, uh, they emit x-rays. That's all the gas that's just dying and falling into the into this black hole. And it sings a swan song of in x-rays. <laughs> we are all into music now. So that, uh, the, the, that, that last gas, the swan song of uh, this dying gas that's just going into this black hole is never to be heard of again. The, the, uh, those, yeah, those are the nuclei of galaxies. <laughs> wow, lovely, lovely. Huh. Maybe I want to at some point hear that one. So, <laughs> Maria. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you so much for this fabulous presentation. I want to say there is no one in the universe, in the cosmos, who is less of a scientist than I am. So, <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm coming at this from another perspective, but I really want to put together the idea of the vastness of the cosmos, the potentiality that Rev. Jim talked about, and our tininess, but also um, we're all we have. Like I'm the only one who can do what I can do. I'm the only one who can hear uh, the spirit of the universe talking to me to hear the message that I'm supposed to hear because so it, it must make a difference that each of us is here even though we're so tiny. So this whole conversation um, made me think of a Mary Oliver poem and I'm not gonna read the whole thing but if you'll indulge me I think this is this is what it's the second half um, of the summer day. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the field, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do 
with your one wild and precious life. So thank you for the reminder that um, the, the great paradox is that, of course, we don't matter at all. And of course, we matter infinitesimally. Hugely. I did that backwards. <laughs> I, I, hugely. Thank you. Universally. He's the scientist. OK, yeah. Thank you, Maria. It looks like you were a, you were a, how do you call those people that are put in the audience to say the right thing at the right time? <laughs> because that was like the perfect closing. So does anybody, because we are just out of time, it's 8.02, does anybody have any last thoughts, any comments? If not, you can just unmute yourselves when, when you feel like it and maybe just say a word or a phrase as something that you want to carry with you out of this time. Thank you. And Thank you. Comes. Thank you. And I'm in gratitude for sharing. I'm trying to connect it with my life, you know, from a baby boy is from XY chromosome to getting together, having a quickening, a bundle of his and the ga uh, galaxies I'm trying to connect with the our uh, uh, world, how different countries were together, got apart, coming back together, all these things I'm trying to connect back, uh, the relationship with a humble way. And I'm thankful to all of you. I felt a, a superpower is there beyond my imagination, which I cannot grasp everything, but I'm very grateful to Sangeeta for her thirst to know, to explore what she saw from that uh, uh, housetop. So it's a great blessing. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah. And I would thank, you know, for JWST and other projects, it typically thousands of engineers, um, people who do communication, people who do procurement accounts, all of the support that's needed, people who write software, it's all thousands of people. It's not just one person. Takes a village. <laughs>